I'm Mary Claire Briswa. I'm the founding executive director of the Technology and Applied Composition Program at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Thanks for joining us today. I'm coming to you live from Zoom with my students, uh, where we now study uh, film scoring, video game music, and interactive audio. Uh, today, we have a very special guest who's going to share his wisdom with us, Jonathan Mayer. Uh, those out in the world might know Jonathan for his amazing uh, skills as a composer and a producer. He worked at Sony PlayStation for over a decade. He helped found and establish our world famous Sony project that we do at SFCM. And he's produced big scores such as The Last of Us and Call of Duty in some of the best studios in the world. These days, he's developing workflows and managing producers and the facilities amazing recording facilities he helped develop at Facebook. And when he has spare time, he comes to the conservatory and drops serious knowledge on modular synthesizers, mixing, production, and uh, engages in experimental music making with us and our students. Jonathan is a wonderful mentor, teacher, producer, and friend of the program. And I'm so happy to welcome him here today. Jonathan, welcome. Hi, thanks. I'm so excited to see all you guys. So what do you got in store for us today, Jonathan? So uh, today we talked about just um, <clears throat> sharing some, I've, I've got a couple Pro Tools sessions that represent a couple different pieces of music that have been recorded in the past year um, by my team at Facebook. And what I wanted to do is just kind of dig into these Pro Tools sessions and demystify working with um, large ensembles. I, a question I get asked a lot is um, about producing and mixing projects where we have, whether it's an orchestra or, you know, large sectional ensembles. Um, the two pieces we're going to look at, one is a fairly traditional orchestral lineup, um, with, but it's a hybrid piece with some synthesizers and stuff. And then I have another piece that's uh, more like a big band um, piece and uh, collaborated with a TAC professor, Daria, who's here also, and she orchestrated and um, conducted that one too. So when, when we get to that, Daria, maybe you can uh, you say, say some things about it too. Um, but what I want to do is just kind of, it's very informal. I'll take questions uh, throughout. I don't want anyone to wait to ask a question. Please interrupt me. Um, I don't have um, a really specific plan here other than I'm just going to pull these apart. I um, either mixed or co-mixed both these tunes uh, along with some of the engineers on my team and produced them. And so what I want to do is just talk about um, sort of like where you start when you come home from a session with a track like this and, uh, you know, just show you exactly what we did. Um, one thing I will say is I approach a lot of this stuff very unconventionally. So I don't want anybody to think that there's, that I'm pushing a, a prescription for how to mix this kind of music. This is just how we did it in this instance. So um, I think we break a lot of convention, um, especially with the orchestral stuff. And um, I hope that's okay and doesn't bother anyone. But if you want to know why, you can ask. Um, and then I'll, I'll also get into some of the nuts and bolts of how these Pro Tools sessions are put together, why we um, sort of build the busing the way we do. And um, one of those things I'll get to as we go and feel free to ask about is, is how we bus for stem printing. Too, which is a big deal for us. Everything we make um, needs to be stemmed as wide as possible when we're done mixing it. Um, so that's that. Are there any questions so far before I get started or anybody want to say anything? I have the chat window over there too. I have a feeling we're all fine with the convention breaking for sure. So definitely looking forward to it. Also, Jonathan, just letting you know, the gig is all here. Everyone showed up for this lecture as I'm looking through, I'm seeing everybody's faces, and I'm so glad to see everyone. Yeah, it's everyone. really nice to see you guys. I miss everybody. Likewise. Well, um, let me let me um, start off. I'll just I'll talk about this uh, piece for a second. This is a piece I actually wrote about. Um, <clears throat> 
it's almost a year old now. Um, it's called Total Perspective, as you can see here on the screen, um, which doesn't have any real significant meaning. Um, the title doesn't. I just for fun, I wanted before I play you this, I wanted to talk about uh, how this piece came into being because it's kind of a fun story. And I have um, a couple clips I'm going to grab and pull into Pro Tools here while we're doing this. Um, we were working on some making some little sound IDs for a few products um, and they were like mnemonic, uh, like four or five note max little mnemonic things. And I had this piece that was roundly rejected um, right here. And let me make sure this is playing okay. No. Did my audio go away, Torn? No, I'm not hearing it. That's interesting. Hmm. You can hear that? Great. Hmm. Fascinating. I can't hear any of you guys now. Yeah, actually, I didn't. Oh. I didn't hear that. Um, okay. When you played that clip, I did. I didn't hear it just now. Uh, maybe you can uh, try to play it again. Is something else below soloed? No. Weird. Awesome. Now we all get to watch Jonathan troubleshoot. This is this, this, is, is, whole, this, this is how the music gets made right here. Every no, that, audio professional gosh, must know how to troubleshoot. That, um, okay. When you played that clip, I did. I didn't hear it just now. Um, you can, yeah, the audio preferences are correct. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can play the entire session, Jonathan, as we oh. were earlier, and see how, how that sounds. Oh, I see what's going on. Oh, this is a stupid mistake, actually. My track was an input. Uh, it's Pro Tools' fault, everybody. It's my fault. Okay, here we go. So everybody heard that, right? That became that became this. So that was the final that was the final production of that thing and like I said it got rejected. And then um when I was archiving the session, I ended up um accidentally playing it through this synthesizer here. Um which is a Dave Smith uh, Prophet Rev 2. And I just happened to have this, um, this like crazy patch set up and it sounded like this. And I was like, whoa, that's amazing. That's not even the same piece. Um, so then I wrote this and I don't know if everybody had a chance to listen to it. I'll play it through and then we'll start going through the mix.
So uh, my favorite thing about that is just how short of an idea that was. And when I, when I, um, <clears throat> when I sort of blocked it out with, with a orchestral mock-up template, it came together really fast. I mean, I think all the writing and arranging probably took um, maybe five or six hours total. Um, and then the, and then getting the synths in there um, was probably another day of production. And then we had it orchestrated and recorded it. So this was recorded in Nashville um, in April of last year. And um, the band, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I think it was about 35 or 36 string players and about 12, I can figure out how many brass players we had. Um, but we had a decent sized brass and woodwind section and then all of the, oh, the harp was live. And then everything else you hear is either a sample or um, an analog synth um, recorded here. Um, so we recorded this, as you can see, this is recorded in passes. So um, let me start from the top here. Um, so the way I build my Pro Tools sessions for this kind of thing is I have a track at the very top that I print to. Um, I prefer to do this than bouncing. It's more of a workflow thing than anything. I think there was a time years ago when a lot of us thought that there was a real sonic difference between the bounce function and printing a track in Pro Tools. I don't think that's a thing anymore. I've been hard pressed to find an example where there was actually a problem using one versus the other. But I do, the main reason I like to do this is because I like to playlist my work. So um, there's only one mix of this. We didn't revise it. Since I did most of the mixing and I'm the composer, I didn't have any notes for myself. So um, when I got done, I was like, it's done. Um, which doesn't happen a lot for me, but I played it for our head engineer and he liked it. So we just shipped it. Um, but, um, you know, if I were going to print another mix of this, I'd duplicate this playlist and, um, name it mix two. And then it, that makes it really easy to AB stuff. Um, because you can switch in and out of input, which is what got me a minute ago and listen to your current mix versus the last thing you printed. Um, and if there's a composer ref mix that you need to have in here to check against while you're working, um, you can work that way too. So you'll see in both the sessions I show you tonight, you'll see that there's um, <clears throat> this track at the top that I'm printing to. And then just before that, or just below it, I have a master fader. Um, so you can see this master fader, that bus that I call FB master is going um, is the input for this print track. And there we have some stuff we'll get into. I'm going to, I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to start with sort of the simplest stuff. And then I'll talk to you about like what's on the master bus and stuff. Um, at the pull these plugins now. So we're not hearing them while we, um, go through and look at the individual tracks. So then below, I really like to color code stuff. Um, I work, I actually work with a, a fair number of people who are colorblind, which is really interesting. So I've had to, um, I've had to learn to manage this a little differently because my communication in Pro Tools has always been around the colors of tracks. Um, so that's just an interesting, um, thing I've learned to do in the last few years. But, um, this, this, all of this stuff up here you'll see this entire cluster are VCA faders. Um, and I don't know if everybody uses them or knows what they are, but basically um, in Pro Tools and uh, you know, on a traditional recording console, and I think in most other DAWs, um, a VCA fader is, um, is a fader that controls a group of faders. So if you look here, instead of your traditional Pro Tools IO on a VCA, you have all the groups in your session available. So like we made a group out of all the low percussion and then we make a VCA and we assign that here. Now I'll talk in a little bit about why these VCAs are really important. Um, but when you're working with 
large uh, large ensembles and different groups of instruments like this, it's really cool to have VCA control when you get to the latter part of your mixes. And I'll also show you how we gain stage uh, the VCAs so that we can change the volume going into, that's a nice segue to the next group down here, our submix faders. So these are a bunch of aux returns, all these green tracks here our aux returns and you see they all have a capital SUB at the end. That means that's a submix and that's actually where the stem for that family is gonna be derived from. So that low perk fader up here with the VCA, I can hit the, the solo button and that solos the group down below. So you'll see um, it doesn't activate the solo button, which is a little weird in Pro Tools, but it mutes everything else. See how all these mutes have gone on? So I can tell the only thing in the low perk um, here is this timpani stem, which is barely doing anything. Um, so it's not the greatest example. Let me find another group that's bigger. And again, please interrupt me and ask questions if any of this is uh, confusing. So, okay, so all this is the first pass of brass. I'll hit mute on it and then scroll down here. And you can see it's muted all this brass. And if I, um, if I grab this fader, so this is the VCA I'm talking about, I'm bring it with me. And then you can see the behavior. There's the brass muting and unmuting or being soloed. Now, so when I move this fader, this VCA fader, all of the associated tracks in the group will move accordingly. So it's really cool because once you have all your balance of this entire group the way you want it, you can mix it as a family. Now, we're also routing all this stuff. If you look here, you see that um, everything in the brass woodwind pass one family is being routed to this aux return here and that's where we're going to get our stem from and we're doing some processing there now you can do and i'm going to talk about this throughout the session but you can write automation in three different places now you can write it on the individual track <clears throat> so moving these faders will have a particular effect on that track right and then moving the VCA will affect all of these faders here. Moving this fader on the sub, on the return, on the aux return for the subfamily will also adjust the volume of that group, but you'll be adjusting it after all the processing here. And one thing you'll see in my sessions that I really like to do is I put um, some kind of mastering limiter on my subgroups and I put it on all of them, that's adding a little color. And when I ride the VCA versus the aux return, so I'm moving the fader that moves all the stem, all the individual tracks in the group, their volume is changing as it goes into this limiter. And so I can color that whole group a little bit if I wanna like, you know, if I wanna do like a big brass swell at the end of a section or something, I can really ride that VCA up and it hits the limiter harder and it does something very different than if I were to just ride up the volume after all that processing, right? I'm actually changing the color of that. And um, in a little bit, I'll try to show you an example of that. Um, let's see one in here. They This track's interesting because the performance is really good and I didn't have to mess with it a lot to um, supplement the dynamics of the band, which is something when you have great players that you just don't have to do. So um, so then down below, so that's all these, these green tracks. Um, so down below here, I've got another group of aux returns and these are all my effects returns. Now, because I wanna print individual stems, I use an individual instance of a particular reverb or whatever. I think these are all reverbs. Um, and when we get to the other track, you'll see a menagerie of other types of, uh, of effects returns. We, we were using echoes and stuff like that on that other track. Um, but here you'll see, I've got a lot of redundant 
instances of reverbs and that's you know i'm using altiverb in a couple different places the settings are probably different but um that's because i want to be able to print discrete stems and bake the reverb into the stem so if you'll notice the low percussion reverb here is going to that low percussion sub up above that we looked at the green track um here so again when i commit this track I'm getting the reverb baked into it. Um, when I come back from a recording session like this and I mix the first tune or two, this template um, gets pushed out to every song. So another aspect of this workflow is when I'm, when I'm done mixing a song like this, I'll delete all the audio files, clear all the automation so that I just have this stuff set at its base setting volume and panning wise leave all the plugins intact <clears throat> and save a template. And then I'll just import those settings on top of all the same tracks and all the other files from the session. And it speeds things up. So it might take me a full day of work to get one mix like this done. And then I can do three or four a day after that, barring any kind of weird hiccups. So it's a very quick way of working. Um, so down below the reverbs, um, I've got my synth tracks, anything that wasn't part of the orchestral recording session here. And in this track in particular, it's not a lot of stuff. One thing I'll make a, this isn't a mixing comment, this is more of a production thing, but one thing, um, and I think a lot of us have talked about this before, but one thing I care a lot about is when you're blending synthesizers with orchestra is that you create space for each and that you're not just using synths to do things that you're also using the orchestra to do but that the synthesizers are other instruments in your ensemble and it sounds like common sense but i find that a lot of like orchestral and synthesizer hybrid music is kind of one or the other like it's it's not truly hybrid and that even even watching a lot of listening to a lot of film scores watching movies and stuff um you hear a lot of stuff where it's like, oh, they just doubled the, you know, the double bass lines with a low synth so that it would sound more modern or, or you know, beefier. And uh, I really struggle with that most of the time because um, it sort of negates both instruments. Like now there are exceptions to that. And actually this tune has a great exception to that because this um synth that i showed you that i that gave me the idea for this song is doubling the brass and that and that's very deliberate because together um, that sound and the live brass make a sound that doesn't exist anywhere else so that was a specific example of wanting to do that but i was very careful going into it to sculpt the synthesizer so that it augmented the brass um it's adding that buzz but it's literally just for the most part, it's just the brass line um, throughout the tune. Um, so that's, you know, have a rule and then break it, uh, I guess, is the thing. But um, so here we have uh, all these tracks. Now you'll notice most of these tracks don't have a lot of um, plugins and processing going on. And that's because I spent a lot of time getting those sounds the way I want them. Um, with my fake orchestra samples before I go to the stage. And I really like to, especially when there's any kind of groove or rhythm, I really like to encourage the players to listen to a little bit of the prelays, the synthesizer stuff, if they're willing, if it's not distracting or messing with their um, approach to the track. And, and there are exceptions to that. Like sometimes I'll do things with synthesizers that'll confuse pitch a little bit deliberately and i don't want a string session a string section listening to that while they're trying to um, record but in this case um i wanted them to have nice clean tracks to work with so the the bass is a um the bass that's in here is a moog uh subsequent 37 And one thing I'll point out about this that's really cool, um, because um, those of you who know me know I'm a, a big advocate of using the hardware rather than the software versions of these things. 
the main reason is just the sound, but also this is a performance. So I got this thing synced to my Pro Tools session, but I'm playing it. I'm using the arpeggiator on the synth and I played the whole thing down. There's no, there was no MIDI track um, that was programmed in for this. And what's cool about that is the filter sweeps and stuff. <laughs> All that stuff's just played by hand. And that's just like cranking the the distortion feedback on the filter at the end of that passage. Um, this thing also has some sub frequencies, hence the name that I really like. And you'll notice in the in the full track that <clears throat> um, that kind of hopefully if we did this right that lives in its own space right so there's not uh, a tuba or something else down there trying to double that part or I mean uh, there's none of that going on so it's like this is the synth line and it lives down there and it does its thing um, on top of that I have um, an electron uh, digitone FM synth playing a lot of the ornaments you hear in the track. And in the middle kind of bridge section, it takes a little more of a. Kind of rhythmic roll. And that's another one where I, um, I did program that, but I programmed it in the sequencer on board the digitone rather than in my DAW. Again, I just like to work that way. Um, I actually have a, if any of you use electron instruments and you want this, I made a, I made a spreadsheet that, um, has the MIDI program change numbers for like every bank and pattern on an electron device. And I just dropped those on the timeline and pro tools. So I'll, 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 I'll program it all into the electron and then just play the thing down and record it. And that's cool. Cause I can do a bunch of knob tweaking and stuff in real time. Um, then below that, I have um, this patch that's called um, Vangelis Pad from the Dave Smith uh, Profit Rev 2. And that's the feature of the piece in my mind. And um, I really cranked it up here at the end. You can see in the waveform. And for that one, I actually did um, go ahead and program the MIDI because like I said at the beginning, it was the accident of routing my uh, silly little like marimba uh, melody through that pad that caused me to have the idea for the piece in the first place. So I mapped the whole thing out um, on the timeline and then again, played the synth. Um, I don't know, that synth's right here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's this one. And I actually played it um, <clears throat> while I recorded it. So I think I probably did four or five takes of that and I might've even edited it together, like comped one, um, where I was messing with the filters and the ADSR, uh, on the volume and stuff as I went. Lastly, I've got a couple, um, more subtle things in here. That last one's not subtle at all. Here's this, uh, I have another Dave Smith uh, box, the OB6, that I used for this stuff here. And I'm going to play that and unsolo it because that's one of those things that's kind of, um, when I talk about mixing, I talk a lot about um, thinking of it. I, th I think of all my mixes visually. And so there's um, like a painting, you know, you've got like, um, foreground, midground, background stuff. To me, this is a really like mid to background sound and it's um, hard to hear in the full mix, but watch, I'm gonna play this, but I think it matters a lot. So I'm gonna play this and then I'm gonna unsolo it so you'll hear the whole mix pop in. Um, 
Um, and so that thing to me was super essential um, in the mix, but again, pretty subtle. And I think if I remember correctly, when we were when we were pre-mixing this for the stage, I kept turning that down. And so I, you can see I printed it not super hot. Um, I have a MIDI piano in here. It's just playing those downbeats. So that's really just a percussion part. And then below that, you'll see um, these were my uh, temp mock-up stems. So I always keep those in the mix session, <clears throat> especially um, if it's not my music, you know, if it's another composer and I'm mixing, because frequently you'll get asked to feather these in um, or even feature them if there's something that either the orchestra didn't play exactly the same or if the blend of sampled stuff doesn't quite isn't quite reflected in the final thing, I'll end up using these stems. And so I keep them handy. I keep them close and with the family that they'd be printed with as a stem if I need them. So I can just activate these if I need them, pop them in there and start using them. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of the stuff I've done over the years, we use the composer's mock-up stems along with the live stuff. Um, it's usually not, they don't just get chucked out the window because we recorded something live and frequently especially with like weird effects like aleatoric things and stuff it, you never get it the same with the band um with my composition i i prefer that because i hate hearing a sample that i know everybody else has in my music but a lot of composers um that i've produced on the day on the stage when we're recording get really hung up on like that effect not being exactly the same and they'll put the conductor and the and the orchestrator through hell to try to get it exactly the same and at the end of the day it's like can we just use the sample because it's right here and um so that ends up sort of being a good reason to keep them handy too so now we get down into um the stuff i really want to talk about now we recorded um at ocean way studios in nashville and a lot of people <clears throat> pack a whole orchestra into that room i don't think it's big enough for more than 35 or 40 players. I think the room compresses when you put too many people in there, you hear the walls. It's a really, it's an old church. It's a beautiful studio, but the footprint of the room, um, I forget the dimensions, but it's not big enough in my opinion for a whole band. And from talking to the players over the years, I mean, I've been working there for over 10 years now with that group of players. They're pretty uncomfortable when they're all in there at the same time too. So, I mean, they're kind of like stepping over each other and there's no room for their cases um, and stuff like that. So <clears throat> what I generally do is either run a session where I do strings in the morning and brass in the afternoon. All the chairs are in there and set up, but the band is um, taking turns or um, we'll do all the strings, you know, for a few days and then bring in the brass. I prefer to go back and forth um, because with brass and woodwinds, especially recording them all day um is brutal um and they'll do it you know professionals will say they can do it but you can tell by the end of the day um and if any of you play those instruments you probably know this um their their lips are just shot um and especially if you're doing you know like if you're producing a game score you're probably recording a lot of action music um and it's hard so um i like to split them up and go back and forth plus for me in the in the control room, it's just a little more interesting. And you can hear <clears throat> pieces of music come together a little more quickly that way. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, we recorded um, the brass and woodwinds in this configuration. I'll show you where all these mics are. Um, I mean, I'll describe where they are in the room. So we have a traditional, uh, what's called a deca tree, which is basically just above and behind the conductor in that room and it's a lcr setup so we've got a left center and a right mic i believe for this session um we were using um neumann m50s which are beautiful large diaphragm um tube mics um for the on the tree and traditionally um that's the main thrust of an orchestra recording um and a lot of times when i sit down with these tracks 
I like to um, listen to the tree first. And like when we're editing and comping everything, that's usually just what I'm listening to. So I'm going to turn off all my plugins here on the brass and just let you hear the tree real quick. Um, let me see if I've got volume automation here. I'll just put some in. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the automation off. Oops. Okay. Now we will just listen to Hang on. My solo mode is now latch. Okay. That's the whole brass family. So down here, I've got some groups. And as you can see, I created a sub fader, um, an aux return just for the tree. So you'll see the tree, the three tree mics. I like to um, do a little processing on the tree uh, as a unit because I want it to be sort of the main sound in, um, in this scenario. So let me get my tree going here and I'm going to flatten them all to zero. And this is what the brass and woodwind tree sounded like. Sorry, I had reverb and my processing on the sub there. Okay, so this is dry. Somebody asked about the reverb. I'll, I'll show you all the reverbs. Who was it? Moya? Okay. Great question. Um, hang on one second and I'll get to that. I'm going to show you all that routing and, and I'll open the reverbs up. Um, so all I did was pan these where they go. Now, if I go back to my automation, check out what happens to the levels here. Notice that the center mic is down 60B from the left and right. I find that the stereo image is a little better that way in this particular scenario. Now we're working in stereo. If we're working in surround, it's a different story. Although <clears throat> the vast majority of the game scores I've mixed in surround, we did in quad because we like to leave the center channel free for sound effects and dialogue and stuff. Um, film convention puts a little more stuff in the center channel. <clears throat> So that center mic becomes a little more um, useful. So um, I'm going to bring that up to the same level as the, uh, I'll turn off my groups here. I'm going to bring this center mic up to the same level as the mics on the left and the right and show you how the image changes when I pull it down. Okay, so here they are all at um, the same level. Nope. Okay. Why?
Sorry. My keyboard's freaking out. Hang on a second. Okay. Now I'm going to play it one more time and just pull it down. I'm going to use a different section. I hope that's coming through. Is that, can you guys hear that? Is the stereo working? Okay, cool. I have my um, speakers pretty low in here so they don't come over the mic and I couldn't really hear. So that's why I put the headphones on. Um, so as you can see, it kind of, it's kind of like the, there's a lot of cool low end in the center channel too. And so it's an interesting trade off because I want to keep that in the mix. Um, but I find that as I pull that center channel mic back, the sides just kind of bloom and I'm not turning them up, but it sounds like they get louder just because we're not clouding the middle as much. Um, so then next, um, I'll show you what we did on here. So this is a, a waves plugin that emulates um, an SSL uh, signal path. And so if you look what we're doing, and I have to remember what we did here, but um, we're doing a fair amount of EQ, but it's all pretty subtle, right? So we're boosting um, on a bell curve, we're boosting um, just below 2K in the highs to just brighten this up a little bit. And then we're cutting this um, around 850 Hertz which is probably getting some woofiness out. Um, so I will, I'm gonna copy these settings and then I'll paste them back after I mess with it. And then as you can see, um, there's probably a little compression going on here too. So I'm gonna play this and I'm gonna mess with these EQ settings and show you what we decided to do. So what I'll do is I'll crank up this um, high frequency here I'll just crank them up each one at a time so you can hear what we were going for. And then I'll put them back where they are. So here the, the low mid is a cut and everything else is a boost. This is a really slight boost here, it's half a dB. So check it out while I play. cool um so i hope everybody can hear that it's like the the low mid especially boosting that it's just like this honky nasty thing that um some somewhere in that range i always you know with a big, big brass section like that i usually want to pull a little bit of that back um and then you'll see the the um the bottom low frequency boost is a, is just a shelf and we're just getting and you notice i'll play that again and turn it up you can hear the low brass especially really come to life. Um, and then this compression is pretty subtle, but um, just kind of glues it all together. Um, so let's talk about the reverb. So then we add a little reverb here. Um, here's what that sounds like. I'll just play and stop a couple times so you can hear the tail. That's, this is with the reverb. And then without. pretty huge difference. Um, and that's a pretty live room, but it's just not that big. So the, the reverb tail is not that long. So if I go up here 
um this is the reverb on the tree it's altiverbs mechanics hall um i use altiverb a lot and if you look at my mix sessions and you look at my altiverb settings i almost always have some version of this eq curve <laughs> in my altiverb i think altiverb sounds amazing and i think it's also really muddy and it and when you use a lot of instances of it in a mix um because there's such accurate room impulses there's just a lot of low frequency buildup, and so i'll always have um something like this here and if you use uh altiverb when you um ah when you they this is the default view in altiverb right here it's called waterfall i find it to be absolutely useless i don't know why it's the default um i don't know if any of you look at this and go oh yeah okay uh to me it's just like weird pretty colors and stuff um this makes sense to me so i always switch it over to this um the pre-delay in all all the altiverb patches always def defaults to zero so i always add um, a fair amount of pre-delay for something like this. Um, so that's over here. You can tempo sync it too, which is pretty rad. Um, be very careful with the settings down here. There's some modulation stuff that'll make your uh, reverb tails all pitchy. Um, so I try to stay away from this, this little carrot. Um, and the EQ is accessed over here. So this curve, you can click and drag on stuff, but if you wanna be more accurate, you just click on this EQ and then you've got your frequency. So you'll see at 240, I'm cutting four dB out with um, the, the widest Q it'll give me. So I'm, I'm all the low mids I'm going after in this reverb. Um, real quick, I'll play it for you and turn the EQ off and you can just see if you can hear the difference. It, it might be too subtle, but I'll try it. So it's subtle, I think. Um, at least on my monitors here, it sounds pretty subtle. But again, it's the culmination of reverbs too in the session that will cause that low frequency buildup. So one instance of altiverb might not be a problem, but I have um, five of them running at least. Yeah, so um, that's doing that. Now, um, let's go look at the rest of the brass tracks. So that's just the tree. Um, and I spend a lot of time after a session figuring out where I want that, but I never like to go too long when I'm mixing. And this is true actually of any genre, any, any ensemble, any kind of mixing I ever do. I think a big trap that a lot of us fall into is spending a lot of time listening to our stuff soloed because, um, the word mixing implies that we're listening to all this stuff and getting it to work together. And so spending a lot of time uh, carving up something up without context is super dangerous. So I wouldn't probably do everything I just showed you with these just soloed, right? I'd be flitting back and forth between the different um, options I had available. So in the room, we've got um, these brass woodwind mics called wide mics, and they're probably... Um, I don't know the exact distance they are, but they're on a plane um, with the tree. If you're if you're standing where the conductor would be, think of them as just being like about um, about twice the distance of well, or three times the distance of the left and right mics from the podium out on the sides. Um, so in at Ocean Way, they're about. Uh, halfway between halfway and two thirds of the way out in the room, but on that same plane. And I'll show you what those sound like. And this is a stereo pair. And then with the tree.
So I'll just play it and take that in and out a couple times. So I really, I don't know if you can hear the difference as I'm bringing it in and out, but I just love the way that kind of colors it. It's almost like an, its own EQ. And so if you notice that track doesn't have any EQ on it per se. And the way I arrive at that um, decision when I'm working, and I encourage everyone to do this kind of thing, is I'll just start with this turned down below where I can tell what it's doing to my mix. I'll listen to the tree. And then I'll just slowly bring this up and I'll just try to find a sweet spot where I think it sounds good. I'm going to throw my headphones on again for this. So I don't know if you can hear that. To me, it sounds really subtle and mostly it's adding a lot of air, which is what it's supposed to do. The mics are out wide there. Um, turn all my automation back on. And then uh, I've got these wide surround mics, which are further back in the room. I've got I mean, further out, I'm sorry, the wide surround mics are all the way to the corners of the room at the front. And then below that, we've got these rear surround mics, which are on the opposite end of the hall, um, basically behind the brass facing out. There's another pair down here um, that are overhead ambient. It's an overhead ambient mic, and I think it's a stereo ribbon. And it's basically, you know, because the it's it's kind of a long room and the brass are behind the strings um this is like an ambient it's like a second tree that's the way i kind of think of it although it's stereo only and it's back uh, just a few feet in front of the front most seats in the brass section um so this mic's really cool actually let me show you what that one sounds like it's down pretty low so i'm going to turn it up It adds a lot of color. Um, we keep it low in the mix because um, it'll give you too much presence. If you want a natural sound, you don't want your brass to sound like they're right on the mic. Like, like they sit where they sit for a reason um, in an orchestral uh, arrangement. And you know, for various purposes, we'll move them around in the room if we really want them to be more or less present rather than try to rely on a mic. But in a pinch, uh, in a mixing situation, you, this is one of the options you have to like ride this thing up and get more presence from the brass too. Um, here are the surround mics real quick. These are the front surrounds. And you'll see they have like a little more of a diffused um, sound, ambient kind of sound which makes sense based on where they are. And we um, have them going to the same reverb as the tree for that reason. So it's just like a nice, cool additive reverb effect. And then I'll bring in the the rear surrounds too. Can you hear the low brass pop when I turn the rear surrounds on? Like I feel like that rear surround mic is mostly bass trombone, um, <clears throat> which is cool. 
and we EQ'd that. Yeah, so we EQ'd um, a shelf above 5K into that and cut out. Again, it's in that same range where the brass get kind of woofy or honky. Um, we cut out this 700 hertz, so check that out. nobody likes that sound um so that's all blended as you can see it's all just blended there's no um there's no like hard science to this i don't think i mean it's all just blended by ear and that technique i showed you where you just you know you take the next set of mics you're comparing and you bring it up slowly um kind of find a spot where it works what you want to be really mindful of is that things aren't detracting from the sound and if they are you either eq them when you have a larger ensemble recording like this never be afraid to throw out a pair of mics too we've got all these mics and if you're like sitting there fighting with your rear surrounds and you're like ah they kind of muddy things up or they, they they collapse the image toss them you don't need them um you know and you'll see when we get to the strings actually we don't use the same collection of mics um for the strings that we do for the brass i mean that the same mics are set up in the room, but we balance them a lot differently. So then um, real quick, lastly on the brass, and I want to move on to the strings, we get into um, the spot mics. So in the case of the brass, every player you'll see has a, has a close mic on them. So this is um, the first flute. And then the second flute. The oboe. Clarinet one. Um, those are all the clarinets. There's a bassoon mic. And then um, now you'll notice those are all pretty low in the mix. And again, I'm using that same technique where I just feather them in to a point where I think it's adding. I do use them to feed a reverb and it's a separate reverb. I call it the spot verb for the spot mics. And um, I've got a different setting on there. I'm using um, Liquid Sonics Seventh Heaven, which is um, uh, basically a ripoff of the Bricasti M4, which is, I think, the most expensive uh, hardware reverb on the market right now. I'm not sure, at least new. Um, and this does a pretty good job. We actually, when I was at Sony, um, we have a big rack of M4s and we were a being this plug in with it some years ago and it holds up pretty well. Um, so I like this one a lot and it's relatively inexpensive. I think it's probably $300 or something compared to the thousands of dollars that the M4 costs. Um, and, uh, so this is just a long haul it's only two two and a half seconds here um and it's for those spot mics now why i have the spot mics as low as i do in the mix is again not to give us a false sense of um you know close like like too much presence um we do eq them quite a bit um just to keep the i'm not this eq is not doing much it's just cutting a little high end it looks like but um we're doing that to just sort of like get it to sit with all the room mics so all that stuff i showed you with all the room mics would be sort of balancing the ensemble and then when that's done we just feather in these spot mics notice that they're all panned pretty aggressively i find that with um orchestral stuff especially uh, when i bring the spot mics in one thing i that they're really useful for even though they're low in the mix is placing the instruments in the room and giving a sense of space. So I pan them pretty hard, um, you know, based on where they're sitting. 
and I rarely leave even a player that's sitting in the middle of the room. I rarely leave that mic right in the center. I'll like push it a little bit one way or the, or the other, just to give you a sense of the room. Um, I want to say something real quick about the French horn mics, because every engineer I've ever worked with puts microphones um, in front of the French horns and they put microphones behind the French horns pointed at the bells. And I've never used those bell mics in a mix in my entire career. And they sound awful. And I always say the bell on the horn points backwards for a reason. Um, that's just my opinion. I have a strong one, but I feel like this sound is what I want out of a French horn. And here I will activate these just for the sheer horror of it. <clears throat> and let's see what they sound like. They're up too loud. So there's that. Um, they don't sound, they don't sound too bad, but they're just sharp to me. Um, and it's just a sound you don't need, um, in the mix. I feel like if I can't get enough out of the horns that I just turn up those front spots and it usually works. Um, the last thing I'll say about mixing with the spot mics like this is um that um when you're at the stage where you're writing automation and you're actually like finishing your mix you'll find that subtle moves if, you, if you've got this type of balance now if you have a very different balance this won't apply but if you've got a balance where it's like really room heavy and then you're riding the spot mics to try to get an effect um or to like really hear that line in the flute solo or whatever you'll notice that what you think of as a normal move, you know, if you're writing like a vocal in a traditional pop mix or something and you push it a couple dB, that's a lot, right? You hear the change. With these, you have to go really big. Um, so don't be scared to write like a 6 dB swell into a spot mic. Um, you really have to, have to mix it with a lot of movement in there. Um, quite a few of the scores I did, um, at PlayStation the last few years I was there, we worked with um, a mix engineer named Alan Meyerson, and he mixes all of Zimmer's scores and uh, works with uh, dozens of other big name film composers. And um, he would mix with us on the scores we worked on with him. And so he wasn't always driving. And he had like, I felt like a catchphrase where just frequently we'd just hear him in the room go, no small moves, no small moves, whenever we were write, writing automation on something. And he's right. Um, little tiny moves on these spot mics are just a waste. So um, feel free to push them around a lot. And again, um, you'll get, you know, you'll, it's, it's not something you can do subtly and really hear. Um, I'm, uh, I'm looking at Daria's question. So Daria, are you asking if you're saying, would I, would I apply that same level of panning? Is that yes. the question? Yeah. So I'm asking, like you said that you would hardly pan uh, spot mics. So if you, for example, don't have live orchestra, uh, how would you do, how would you do with panning, like just mock-up instruments? Just virtual I, orchestra? It, it depends on the library. I mean, I, I like the Spitfire stuff primarily. That's like my go-to and they're panned pretty well. And so I find that it's more about, you know, they have um, in con in the contact player, they have the, um, the, uh, the three, you know, they have the, what are they called? They're like the close, the far, and then they have another, like a middle, middle ground, but they have those three um, distances. And I find that it's just about balancing those um, and that usually their panning is pretty solid. If I'm putting solo instruments in there, I tend to pan them a little more aggressively. I'll show you some panning tricks down here with the strings too that are kind of interesting. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, it I would say I would do as much as I had to do with the samples to just make sure I, I was hearing the space. But again, a lot of sample libraries actually, I think, 
overdo it on the panning a little bit. Like I find that they're a little hard to back out of. Um, strings, especially like the Spitfire strings are very uh, over to one side. Um, so real quick, now that that's the, um, I want to get to the other song. So let me, um, it's funny. Um, we've been doing everything, um, you know, virtually um, my team at Facebook since the, uh, since we all got sent home. And what's funny about it is, uh, at Facebook, you know, we like conference rooms are at a premium cause so many people work there. And so when you have an ending to a meeting, it always ends like right on time. And what I find now that we're doing all this video conference based stuff is that I just talk way too much. So sorry, I, I just looked at the time and was like, whoa, I got to move faster um, because we don't get kicked out of rooms anymore. So we just sit here and like we'll book a meeting for an hour and then like two hours into it, we'll, everybody will be like, oh, crap. Um, so anyway, um, so we're still listening to the brass. I'm going to bring the groups back and just solo the brass. And I'm just going to show you what we put on the submix of the brass here. Find a spot where they're playing. Okay. So I've got, um, let's see, I've got all these goodies and a tape machine. Okay, so, um, and they're in this order. This is one, two, and three in the chain. And as I mentioned before, the limiter is there to do some limiting, but it's also like a cool color. And as you ride the um, VCA up and down that's controlling all those tracks, you can hear this thing change and I'll, I'll do that for a second. Um, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take these out of bypass one at a time so you can hear them. This EQ is doing very little. It's just, um, it looks like it's just the filters, but it's here in case we need it. So I've got a little shelf going on the, to boost some of the highs. And th I think that's specific to this track because it's such a big, like crazy um, uh, brass forward. You know, I wanted that buzzy, crazy in your face, um, I don't know what this is supposed to be. It's kind of like a science fiction-y theme. So um, I'll bring these in one at a time. You can hear what they're doing. The tape machine on the back end, again, is just coloration. Um, and hopefully you can hear that when I bring it in. So I really like the, what this um, Ampex plugin is doing. This is a UAD plugin. Um, and if you can hear the way it's warming it up without adding any mud, notice this, uh, this <laughs> parametric cut on the EQ is right at 800 hertz, um, which clearly I have a thing about because we're cutting it all over the place from this brass section. But um, let me play that one more time and I'm going to just pop this... Uh, tape emulator in and out it's out right now so. and then for before we move on to another family i'll just show you what happens if i were to do a fader move um on let's see i'll go all brass here on the BCA level, um, you can hear how, again, what I'm, the two things I'm differentiating between, and let me know if this is still unclear to anyone, is the difference between the VCA moving all those faders in the family as they feed this chain of plugins versus riding the signal after this chain of plugins up and down. Um, both are useful but this will really affect the color a little bit, should.
hopefully that comes through over the broadcast. Um, so I love to work that way. And there's different limiters we use. Um, you know, one thing, because we mix as a team and we mixed um, this particular, the session that this track was recorded in, we recorded something like 30, I forget what the numbers were. They were crazy. We did, I think we did 32 pieces of music in three days or something like that. Um, it was absolutely nuts. We were really well organized. <laughs> um, but um, we mix it all as a team, like four or five of us. So once we build a template, we kind of stick with this chain uh, for the duration of that project. But then, you know, we swap stuff out. Um, and it's like, it's a combination of what the project calls for. And then what we as engineers is, are just like, what's the new shiny thing that we're playing with um, that month that we think sounds cool. I, there aren't a lot of wrong answers when it comes to this stuff. Garrett, I'm reading your question. Um, that's a great question. Uh, Garrett on the chat asked me, how much do I watch the saturation threshold level with any level changes on those tracks um, or try and keep color going or just let let it hit the color when it gets high enough? Um, I, I mean, the short answer to that is I hope I'm doing it by ear um, and that it's just whatever sounds good at the time. But um, yeah, I, I think, I think that's the answer. I think that's the whole answer. I was trying to think if there was another part to that, but I think that's it is that, you know, we find the, the, the settings that they're set at when we're not riding the faders is, um, you know, kind of just like the optimal level. And then we're assuming if we pick the limiter we like, um, or a tape emulator that it's just gonna, you know, add a little more of whatever it's already doing when we ride it up. If you go too far, you tend to hear it. Um, and again, depending on what you're going for, that hearing it might be really cool. Like what you hear may be amazing in that situation. Um, so back to organizing these sessions, um, this this whole th naming convention here comes from the stage we recorded at. So if you see um, Brass Woodwind Tree left P1, the P1 thing is a convention that most folks use, and that's the first pass of brass. You'll see I have another brass pass here. I actually think this is just going to be woodwinds, if I remember. Nope. I'm wrong. It's a solo. So that was just a choice I made um, production wise to get that on its own, um, just so I could manipulate it. And if you notice, it's a little wetter than the brass proper. Um, that horn player's name is Jennifer. I can't remember her last name, but she is so good. She has such a great tone. Um, so I just wanted to be able to, to massage this in context. And it's a lot more present than that roomy mix of the, of the brass. Um, now we had a harp player on the session. And we recorded her in a fairly large ISO booth. It's probably the room I'm in here is about 400 square feet. That ISO booth is probably about this big. It might be a little smaller, but it's a good size room for just a harp. Um, but that just makes it easy to isolate things. Um, I tend to put the harp in an ISO booth recording at Ocean Way. Um, when I've recorded in London at Air Studios or Abbey Road, we isolate the harp when we can. Um, it's It makes mixing it fun. So the harp is just a pair of stereo mics panned hard and they're kind of high and low on the harp. And this harp player was so awesome. I wrote this really kooky thing in the middle 
check this out to go with um i think it goes with this synth no okay so there's this synth line and then i wrote this harp thing and i thought i was gonna have to use the samples but we charted it up and we were just like let's see what happens she's isolated and she was all over it this was i think this was one take But I was just super stoked on the timing of that. Um, it's. So on these spot mics on the harp, yeah, and you can see there's no edits here either. Um, <sighs> Thanks, Daria. I, I just thought while I was listening to this, I thought I got to do a remix that's just like built around around these or maybe i'll post these stems and somebody can do a remix somebody who's not me i'll share those those are fun stems um so the harp um if you notice the spot mics we don't have any um we don't have any, uh, oh, I'm reading this now too. Oh, that's cool, Mary Claire. You're gonna have a harpist on the team. <laughs> right on. Um, the, the whole thing that blows my mind with harp is the pedals. Like I, I'm still to this day, I'm like super baffled. This harpist in particular in Nashville, there were a bunch of tracks that the orchestrator put breaks in um, for pedal changes. And she was like, I don't need to stop. And was just like doing all this crazy stuff and i love it in the recording when you hear the pedals moving um she's pretty good about hiding it but um so sorry writing for harp in grad school i told my teacher i wanted to write a piece for harp and flute and he was like why do you want to write for harp i was like well because it's so beautiful and he's like a word of advice about writing for harp and i said what and he said just jump it's too <laughs> So shout out to Mark Lowenstein. I haven't forgotten that conversation and I still don't know how, how to write for harp. So thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, the good ones deal with it in the session and it all works out. Um, so uh, the, the harp spot mics didn't have any, any um, processing on them. We are sending them through a reverb and you can hear it here. maybe it's not too yeah it's it's relatively short let's see what it is i don't remember oops yellow yellow that's altiverb um if you're familiar with altiverb this is the default patch and it's i it's like by far the best um algorithm they have in here and you'll see i'm doing my eq thing again over here um but it's not super long um and then here are the things I, again i'll just show you what we put on the harp chain and i'll unbypass them as we go and you can hear what they're doing same limiter excuse me um this waves uh hybrid compressor and we'll see how hard that's working when we play back here. Um, and then it looks like we've got just a little bit of a mid cut here and cutting the highs a little on one side. That's really it. And this is very subtle stuff. So you know, let's check it out. I'll put it in the, uh, the groove section here
Yeah, that's um, that's the definition of subtle to me to my ear. Um, but it seems like it's helping. The compressor is really not doing much at all. Okay. I'm just looking at the chat thread. A harp sextet. That's amazing. <laughs> That's a lot of pedals. How many pedals is that? Um, as part of my, um, my new profession, I'm also homeschooling a 10 year old. And so I think everything is a math problem now, which is why I went to how many pedals are in a harp sextet. I've been teaching fractions and decimals, which I have no business doing. Um, do I keep limiting? I'm reading, uh, David's got a question. Oh, I missed Sierra's, I missed uh, Sarah's question. Do we keep limiting reduction to generally minus three dB for the peaks? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think the short answer, that's a good question, sir. I think the short answer is no. Um, to be honest, I think we probably came up with that number more by, I mean, that setting more by ear on, um, some of the early things I will say this and, and we'll see this on the next tune. Cause it's a more, um, is it Mary Claire? Is it okay if we go over time-wise? Yeah, go, okay. go for as long as you like. I don't want to. I don't want to cheap out on the other song because it's so rad, and Daria did amazing work on it. And so, um, okay, so on the on the subject of sort of this this style of stem limiting, you know, limiting at the stem level, I like to work this way in every genre because I just like to print stems. I've gotten so addicted to that way of working that I try to do as little on the master fader as possible and have it all happen at that level. So what I try to do is I set up that chain and I try to work when I'm building my mix with all those plugins, either not in yet. Like I, like I don't go get them yet. Like I set up all the busing and build those sub mixes, but there's no plugins on those chains. And those limiters come after I feel like the tune is already balanced, right? And I feel that way about master bus processing too. I never want to be in a situation, if I can help it, where I'm using those things to fix a gain staging problem. And I see that a lot. I see a lot of people do that. And um, you just have to practice enough to know, you know, when I start a mix and I build this busing, let me go, <laughs> there's a lot of scrolling, there's a lot of tracks. Um, and I get, what I usually do is I, um, you know, you click on this button here that brings up the individual fader. I bring up my, oops, sorry, that's my print track. I bring up my master fader and see, I've got all those plugins disabled. And I um, turn off the focus button so I can leave this sitting somewhere on my screen while I'm working. And while I'm doing my early stage balancing things, I constantly have just a rough idea. I don't put like a fancy meter up, you know, like I've got insight um, in this session. Um, knowing the room you're working in and knowing how whatever level your monitors are, I've got a monitor controller over here to my left. And I know in what position that and then there are a pair of um, Dyn audios mounted on the wall behind my screen. And I know in what position sort of uh, Sorry. Yeah. interrupt do you keep it around like 20 negative 24 ish that's like the, the common the monitor or lefs with, with oh the insight? yeah oh for insight yeah um we go for this stuff because we're not um that that would be for like full uh, like minus 24 is usually the target not for a, a music mix but for um like full content that's like a broadcast standard 
So we mix to minus 12, which is more dynamic range than most popular music has in it, but a lot less dynamic range than um, like a classical piece would have or something. So we usually work between um, minus 18 and minus 12. Um, minus 18 has been pretty common for this kind of stuff for us. Um, but I usually bring this in later because because what I was saying is like, I think it's really important to know your room and know, you know, I, I generally work at a fairly low level most of the day if I'm mixing and I leave the, I leave the knob there. And then as my mix gets more and more built up, I tend to turn the speakers down a little because I feel like, um, if I can continue to hear the detail and the separation at lower levels, it means I'm doing it right. Generally. Um, that's just kind of a weird psychological thing. I don't know if there's any technical merit to what I just said. <laughs> um, but, um, but I'll just keep an eye usually on my master fader and see it hovering, um, somewhere in that range, uh, and watch it sort of creep up. And what I want to do with something, um, like this or the, or the next tune we're going to get to is I wouldn't mind if at the end of it all, before I start limiting things and stuff. I'm clipping a little bit here and there and probably not audibly, but I'm seeing overs on the meters. And then I know I'm kind of like sitting right in the sweet spot. And then I can just kind of like gently go like this with all the limiting and compression and just kind of make sure it all stays in place. Um, that's just something you have to practice though. But just like when you're, when you're building your mix, just always checking your levels. It's real easy. Like I said earlier, if you're soloing stuff and you're not listening in context, it's really easy to get stuff like really out of whack and then have to spend a lot of time reining it back in. But I like to bring in anything that's doing that kind of work, limiting um, compression, even even like um, group level EQ and stuff as late in the process as possible. And um, then, you know, you, you probably did a good job of building your stems uh, if that's the case. So uh, let's look at the strings real quick and then we'll move on to the other tune. Um, same principles apply. So I'm gonna go a little faster. We've got the tree here and I've got a sub fader for the tree. And I'll show you the plugin on that. I'll turn off the reverb real quick and notice the delta between, now, the, now remember the strings are a lot closer to the tree. They're right on top of it basically. And um, so the delta between the center mic level and the sides is much greater. Remember, it was a 6 dB difference in the brass. The brass are much further back in the room, um, so the center mic didn't have as much of an impact. I'm gonna do that same thing I did where I bring the um, center mic up and down, and uh, you'll see. So I've got it at minus 17 now. I'm gonna start playback, and if I turn it up, if I'm right, the stereo image will start to get a lot less pronounced. Sorry, forgot to turn off my groups. One more time. So now it's at the same level as the um, left and right, and I'm gonna play again, and then I'm gonna hit undo and put it back where it was, and you can hear the difference. And, and the only way I can describe, I mean, I, I can technically describe what's happening there where it's like, you know, there's less information cluttering up the middle and you pull it back. But th the, the feeling I get when I do that is like, ah, oh, it just like feels like the whole thing just kind of opens up and relaxes a little bit. Now, again, that center mic does have a lot of good low frequency information in it. So that's something I just manage as I select the other thing. So um, now if you check this out, we're boosting um, everything above 10K by 4 dB on this tree. And we're cutting at 3K pretty dramatically, uh, 4 dB. And then um, we're also pushing up 50 Hertz um, as a peak, not as a shelf. And I think some of that might be compensating for what we lost with the center channel. So 
uh, if I remember correctly. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, pop this EQ in and out while I'm playing, and then I'll bring the reverb in. And that's a longer reverb. Let's look at what we're using up there. Just checking the, okay. You guys are just chatting with each other. That's good. I'm not missing anything. Um, let's see, the string verb is another alti verb. Oh, and I was playing with the positioner, which I'll show you real quick in alti verb. Do you guys use alti verb? Is it in the labs or anything? It's in the labs. Okay. So I'm doing my same EQ cut. I'm using the same hall that I was on the brass. Um, no, it's not in the labs, in the studios. Okay. Um, this positioner is really cool. Um, I just copied my settings so I don't lose this, but um, you turn this on and then you can actually mess with where your reverb's coming from in the stereo field. Um, so I encourage you to play with that. It, it'll be hard to hear in this context, but um, it's pretty cool. So I had pushed this kind of back in the room uh, a little bit for whatever reason, just uh, sound. Um, so, okay, so that's our tree. Now check it out, true to form. I had mentioned before that we don't use all the mics and these surround mics, the wide surrounds are inactive on the string pass. So we didn't use them. Um, but the mid wide, the, the wides that are in between are in there. So I'll show you what those are adding to the tree mix. This is just the wide mics. Okay, so the, the wide mics are um, louder in this mix than the tree. And if you're hearing this the way I am, they sound better than the tree to me. And so we made that decision, obviously, um, when we were putting this mix together. So. lot more body um, on those mics. And then here are the, the rear surrounds. Now, speaking of not being conventional, uh, I don't know if you guys play with Sound Toys plugins, but this is a lot of really weird stuff to put on a string, a string mic, uh, mics. Um, so check this out here, I'll turn these off and we'll see what we're doing to the rear surrounds here. So that's cool. I mean, that's adding some grit and um, quite a bit of body to the string. So here, I'll put this back where it was volume wise, and I'll pop it in and out while I'm playing the, the string blend uh, with the other room mics here. I think that one's really happening. And that's feeding the same reverb as the tree too. I agree, Torin. I totally agree. <laughs> Torin said decapitate everything. Hashtag decapitate everything. Um, and that compressor is adding a lot of color there too. So we're getting a lot of body from the strings that way. Now notice um, 
down here, we're not doing much at all with the violin spots. They're 18 dB down, and I probably t had them off to begin with. I don't, I generally don't find a lot of good comes from the violin and viola spots. <laughs> um, there's a spot mic in front of and behind um, the firsts, and then same with the seconds. And depending on the size, if this were a larger string section, there'd probably be more mics, more spot mics on them, but that's enough for a section of this size. Um, and again, all these spot mics are down pretty low. They're feeding their own reverb, just like the brass, um, with the exception of the bass, which I want to talk about real quick. Um, the, I think we had one, yeah, we had one bass mic in this section. And so something I like to do with orchestral bass in these hybrid type situations is if there's two mics or more, I um, pan them where the bases are. I don't like to put the bases in the middle of the room. That's something some people tr do um, to be kind of rock and roll uh, with their with their orchestral mixing. And I think it sounds really muddy. It sounds weird. They're supposed to be over on that side. Um, also, just the way the orchestra balances itself, it, it makes it weird. So we put them where they belong um, on the far right. But what I like to do is take one of the mics and pan it hard the other way and turn it way down. And then you just get this like this, this little bit of bass coming from the other side, but you still don't cloud up the middle. So if you see what we did here is we only had one mic, so we manufactured one. So um, we made this pre-fader send right here that's set at zero and it's feeding this aux track down below. And so this is the bass track. Um, we're boosting the high end a lot here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this up so we can hear it. So it's pretty subtle and there's a lot of bleed there, but check this out. So we made this supplemental track. So it's basically just an effect where we're adding, we're using this R base, um, low end booster and a bunch of EQ to make this like artificial sub. Um, and it sounds like this on its own. I'll put these back where they belong. And now without that, I'm gonna just play the whole string mix. And even though that bass effect is down at minus 20 in the mix, check out the effect it's having on the string section. It's pretty cool. you guys can hear that and on my speakers it's super dramatic like when you take it in and out so that's just nice to get a little bit of that sort of um hyper realistic i almost said unrealistic but like hyper realistic low end um so um that's the whole thing um that's this mix i almost used all our time for this one mix so i was going to jump over to the other tune if anybody does anybody have any questions on this song before i put it away okay jonathan yes can i ask a question not about specifically this song but about like if you would like to sweeten the mock-up with like one life violin so like your string section virtual orchestra and you would like to sweeten with a live violin 
uh, would you do the same approach, like just to edit a little bit, like to put fader up, up until you don't actually hear the solo violin, but you hear that it adds something to the string section, to the violin section. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky, like a single player <clears throat> really stands out. Um, and so, I, yeah, I'd probably, and I'd probably track them at least three times um, with the mic in a slightly different position each time. And I'd probably use a lot of reverb too. Um, but what you said for sure, and then just kind of building around that. Um, but yeah, um, I tend to, personally, I tend to not use soloists to sweeten unless it's specifically to be a solo. Like if I can't get a section, I usually don't just add a single instrument on something that's supposed to be a section. But the way you suggested doing it should work fine. Uh, it should sound good. Any other questions? The next tune's gonna go a little faster because it doesn't have as many tracks. Um, I actually have one quick question. Oh, sure. Um, so would you mix, um, like if you had a woodwind section similar to the brass or would you mix it with the brass? The woodwinds in this session are in with the brass. Um, they were, they were recorded at the same time. Um, but on a lot of the tunes we did in this, uh, marathon recording session, we had them play in passes. Um, there are a couple tunes, um, you know, where we'd... It, I basically, what I do, um, for those of you, some of you have seen me run a recording session, so you've seen me do this, but I basically just like, it's a decision I make on the, on the stage, looking at the score. Um, I just decide what should be on a stem and what shouldn't, you know, on its own. And frequently it's not even the whole piece. So there might be, um, like on this piece, the way we had the French horn solo split out, and then the rest of the brass, that's just kind of something like I open the the book to that page and I look at it and I go, OK, we're going to want this horn on its own. And then maybe somewhere else there's like a crazy rhythmic flute and clarinet part. You know, like if I had had I'm surprised I didn't do this, actually. But if I had had like the high woodwinds doubling that synth line that the harp's playing, um, I probably would have wanted that on its own stem because I'd want to treat it differently than the big brass ensemble in that moment. So. Um, typically in a session, if you've got really good session players, you can just tell them on the fly to do that stuff. You can just say, um, uh, okay, you know, high woodwinds, uh, on this pass, just play your whole part, but lay out between measures X and Y. And they'll just write that on their, on their chart and go, and then you pick it up and it's pretty quick. You don't waste a lot of time doing that stuff. Um, so I kind of keep it all in my head where I just look at the score and I'm, I kind of checkerboard it as I go. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Long winded answer. Um, we okay to put this one away. I'm going to do it. There it goes. Actually, Jonathan, this is more of like a hypothetical question, not specific uh, your session question. Okay. But when mixing um, stems with uh, your live orchestra, do you prefer to have the, like, let's say, like in this case, you had your control over the stems because it was your composition, but let's say you're getting it from the composer. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer to have them completely dry or like have like a baked in reverb, and, but then you don't really have control over that? Like, how do you prefer to have? your stems be um wow that's an awesome question it you know it's funny because i've worked with so many composers over the years that it really varies by composer i think um most sample libraries sound pretty good with that stuff baked in um but i guess it yeah it would depend i'd ha i'd probably have to hear it and then make a judgment call um if it sounds natural and it sounds like something that could blend with the live stuff, I'd probably say, just leave it. If it's not a stretch for the composer, like if it's not a lot of extra overhead, I'd probably just tell them to print them separately just to be safe. I mean, that's the, so the short answer is I'd separate them whenever I can. Um, 
the longer answer, or the, the more honest answer is I'm pretty lazy. So if people start giving me too many stems, I start freaking out because um, I just want to work less most mostly <laughs> when it comes to that stuff. So, um, yeah, but, I, you know, I, I mean, I think the smart play is to split them up. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'll show you, we have some. So this this song, that's a great segue, Sarah. Thank you. This song was written by um, Peter McConnell, who I think a lot of you have either met um, or are familiar with, at least. He's a phenomenal composer. Um, he's one of the reasons I wanted to work on video games when I was young and coming up. Um, and I've been so lucky because I've gotten to work with him kind of a lot um, over the years. And um, he's just just an amazing, amazing composer and person. And um, this is a song he he called me a while back and said, I want to do this thing that's like like backyard junk junk band blues jazz, you know, Tom more upbeat or more uh, lighthearted than Tom Waits, but kind of in that vibe. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but we I fully support you and we should do that. Um, and so he started writing these songs as one-offs and um he asked me if i could get a vocalist and um and i said um i i, I said sure you know at first and then peter started turning these songs in and the vocals were incredible and i was like well who sang these and peter was like it was me and in all these years i'd never heard him sing before so um that was a really cool aspect of this too. To Sarah's point, Peter mocked all this stuff up in great detail and he bakes all his reverbs and stuff in. And um, for the most part, it was fine. But I think with some of these tunes, we had a little bit of challenge um, getting the vocals balanced perfectly with some of his reverb baked in and stuff. So I'll show you how that all played out. Basically, this lineup was... Um, kind of like a like a rock band or jazz combo rhythm section it was a drummer a uh, bassist uh playing upright acoustic bass um guitar and it, what's interesting about it is we had a session guitarist and then we also had some of peter's guitar stuff he did certain things that we weren't going to get in the session or that were really specific um, Peter's a phenomenal player to his, his main instruments, fiddle, um, violin, uh, but he plays, he comes from, he's this really interesting mix of like, um, classically trained, uh, he studied music at Harvard. Um, he's very technical and, um, but also his family and his background is like Appalachian music. And so mm -hmm. He's got all this cool folk tradition. He plays the banjo and um, basically most most guitar family instruments. Um, and now we know he sings too. So he wanted to write this for like a large um, brass and reed section. And so what we ended up with was a nine piece section um, and it's uh, tuba, bass trombone, tenor trombone, trumpet, uh, Barry sax, two tenor sax players, a bass clarinet, and a clarinet. Is that right? Yeah, that's nine. Okay. Daria, correct me if I get any of this wrong. <laughs> You're muted. Uh, I'm you looking are. at the score right now. So you, you're correct. Yeah. So still okay, no cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, um, for those who missed it, Daria actually orchestrated all this music. Um, there were six songs in this um, recording and we did, we recorded the rhythm section over uh, two days. So we did three songs a day, you know, normal seven, eight hour days with the rhythm section. Um, and then we did the um, brass and woodwinds all in one day and Daria conducted and she had to, um, she had to manage some exciting uh, moments. But for the most part, they were fantastic. But uh, we had to ask her sometime um, about the craziest thing that happened in that session. I won't get into it here, but it was it was pretty entertaining. Um, 
and uh, yeah, so um, this all turned out really cool. I'll just go through and show you kind of how we've got a head start because this should look familiar after the last session. Um, I'm going to play the song real quick um, from top to bottom, just like I did with the last one. And I'm going to run to the restroom while I do this. So I'll be right back. I don't look right, I don't feel right I'm permanently stuck in a red light with a cheap suitcase and a mile-wide grin And now a man is moving in It's a full-on cluster It's a supernatural disaster Get here, baby, under this broken light. Scraping out another small time deal with it. Used to be nothing but rainbows in sight. Devils slide down the gutter. Demons reach through the gate with great little horny toad voices. Can't even think straight on a good day. Mm, what a cluster. What a supernatural disaster We used to roll like an 18-wheeler down the open road A thunder made of thunder and sound Over the hills and to the next town None of this Nambi sneaking around None of this The tippy tapping in secret go to say I just ate a cookie, sorry. That's funny, Torn. We were walking around, when we mixed this song, we were walking around saying bibbity to each other for weeks. So as you can see, pretty intricate. Daria had a lot of work to do and uh, she didn't get very long to do it in. Daria, how much time did you have to orchestrate all these? Uh, I think I had 10 days for six songs, which is not a lot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Was, no, no, no. It was like, yeah, I have to do it. And it's cool. We had, um, yeah, we had a, a an arranger who wanted to do it. <clears throat> And then he kind of fell behind and Peter was late turning the songs in. And actually the wildfires last year slowed us down because Peter lives up in the woods in Marin and uh, his power was out for like a crazy length of time. So uh, right before we recorded this, he was actually driving down to our studios at Facebook with his like um, Mac Pro canister 
and a bunch of his equipment and like plugging in in one of our studios and he wrote two of these songs um at facebook he like finished them there <laughs> because he didn't have any power um so daria was the big hero on this whole thing um yep for sure so let me um i'm gonna start kind of i've got all peter's vocal stuff up here oh the other thing we did um that we did after we recorded the brass and the woodwinds was we um we overdubbed some a couple uh kind of like gospel singers a man and a woman um named craig and zoe and i'll show you what they did too but i'm going to skip the vocals we always put the vocals um up at the top here just because when you're finishing a mix if you're doing any um volume automation that's usually where you're focused on a vocal track um so again we have a similar setup but a little less over the top with the vcas we don't create vcas for things that we're not going to use them for so on this set you can see we have the lead vocal the background vocal the drums the bass and the keys and we don't have a vca is this true i think i'm about to tell a lie is the vca for the brass down here yeah i lied so there's a horn vca down here so i think when i was mixing this i dragged this down here because i wanted to have it next to the tracks for some reason so i should have left this up here and as you can see there's a lot of automation going on uh on this horn horn track so let me show you what we did with the drums um and then um this <laughs> we've got the stems i didn't color code the i messed up my own template okay there so now you can see the di differentiation between the stems and all the effects returns here um now on this one in particular richie biggs who's our lead mix engineer um at facebook and richie's a m fabulous um we recruited him he was based in nashville and he joined the company right after i did but he'd been doing a lot of mixing and mastering for them before that and if you look richie up he's got a crazy track record um a bunch of grammys he recorded um i'm trying to think of oh the civil wars i don't know if you're familiar with those guys but richie um i definitely want a grammy with them anyway richie has this cool template um that if you see these things are named differently they're not named according to instrument some of them are like the drum squash thing but this is a whole template that richie's built for effects returns and it's they've got all their uh requisite buses with them too and so um he pulls these in when he's doing these more conventional kind of mixes and then just routes them to the tracks he wants to use them on so you'll see like this seventh heaven reverb he just brought it in because it's a reverb he likes he didn't design it around a particular sound and then uh eventually routed it routed the uh, lead vocals to it and routed it out to the lead vocal stem and that's kind of a more old school um way of working especially for engineers that are used to working on hardware you'll see this kind of approach it's really efficient because um if you think about it in a hardware based studio setting you're sitting at a console and you've got a fixed number of um hardware reverbs in the room and so usually you just patch those into channels on the console and those are your options and so one of the cool things that comes from working this way is you limit your options and you kind of speed yourself up so richie goes okay i know i like having you know a hall and a plate and a room and two kinds of delays and this and that you know and he just maps it all out and pops it in there it doesn't stop him from adding something that doesn't exist but the fact that he has that is really cool. And I don't know if you guys use these at all, but in Pro Tools, um, the track preset feature is absolutely phenomenal. And you can save this whole thing and call it, you know, um, 
effects starter or something like that um and you say okay and then when you go to make a new track um you go to track presets oh where did i put it nah. well okay <laughs> i didn't do it right <laughs> hang on one second There we go. So if you go to track presets, Avid, FX starters, and then I could save multiple presets here. But if I say, okay, it'll create all these tracks with all their requisite busing and stuff. Um, so I have a whole bunch of those saved um, on my writing. This isn't, this is my work computer. I don't typically write on this, but the other computer that's in this room that's not hooked up right now is, um, I have like dozens of track presets and I have, um, you know, I have like large string ensemble and that's like a contact instrument with all the routing for stems and all that stuff. And it's all already made and it just really speeds you up and doing it for mixing is great too. And Richie's a lot bigger on this on the mixing side than I am. But anyway, that's all our returns. Now we get I'm just reading Daria's note. Daria said to mention that the stems of MIDI were prepared amazingly. And it was easy to work with them. You're so right. Peter's really good at that. <clears throat> the mock-up sounded very good. Yep. Excellent point. Thank you, Daria. Okay. Let's check out the drums. So this, um, we had a, we had a microphone in the kick drum and another one outside the kick drum. We had, I believe top and bottom mics on the snare or actually, I think we had a top mic on the snare and then one back, um, kind of pointed at the body of the snare, uh, back a little bit, about a foot. Um, the toms, uh, Richie did this for me. I like to track toms to a stereo track and not print every tom on the kit. He only had a rack tom and a floor tom, so uh, this worked anyway. But even if it's a drummer with a lot of toms, I like to print them just to a stereo track and commit and not have, you know, six mono tracks for a giant drum kit. Um, and then there's the overhead mics, which I believe we were using... Um, I think we used a pair of AEA 44 ribbon mics on this session over the drums. We have a, a stereo ribbon that's like a close room. We have a far room and then this drum rear mic is probably just something weird that we'll check out in a second um, that we put behind the drummer. So um, we had a great session drummer named Kevin Hayes who was totally awesome. Um, he had a small jazz kit. And uh, let me show you what we did to get the kick drum sounds. Uh, so I'm gonna take these plugins off. Now the drums are going through a lot of stuff here. They're going through this drum squash channel. So I'm gonna mute that right now. And if you see here, I don't know if you guys use multiple outputs in Pro Tools, but whenever you see on the Pro Tools IO, whenever you see this little plus sign here, that means this track is going to more than one destination. And so if you hold down control and click on this, you can add another destination. So you'll see the drums and the drum squash bus. And if I wanted to add, you know, seventh heaven reverb, I could do that too. Now I'm going to take that off the same technique. I'm holding down control 
and I'll just uncheck seventh heaven and then it should just be going to those two spots. So um, it's literally just splitting the sig signal um, and going to both those locations. Um, so I muted the drum squash and I'm gonna take, let's see what plugins we have on the drum bus. Nothing, just our limiter. Same limiter we used on the last go round. Um, so I'll leave that on. <laughs> So this is the inner kick mic. And let's look at what we did plug-in wise here. And that's a pretty good sound on its own to my ear. I think that sounds pretty good without anything. So I'll just bring these in one at a time. If you look, we are, um, we're boosting 50 Hertz. We are, I'm just getting my head around this. We're drastically cutting here at uh, 400. And we're boosting, what, 5K and up. So just getting some air, I guess. Let's see how that sounds. So I want to stop and just point out how dramatic that this crazy cut here is doing so much for the kick drum sound. So check this out again. I'm going to, I'm going to just play this. I'm going to put this EQ at zero so it's not doing anything. And then I'll put it back where it was. So the way that, the way my ear reads that is at first when I turn that way down, it's kind of like like the volume just drops a lot, right? Cause I'm cutting that 12 dB, but that 400 Hertz, I'm going to turn it up now is actually detracting from the higher end frequencies on the kick drum. So even though it sort of sounds like the volume's dropping the punchiness of it, uh, ramps up because that 400 Hertz is masking a bunch of the frequencies above it. So for whatever reason, there's just like a crazy 400 Hertz tub thing going on. Um, now we've got this 1176, uh, compressor. So let's see what that's doing. That's nice, more presence there. And then it looks like we are boosting just a little bit with this EQ. Check this out. And then will you add the um, outer kick mic and that's, I'll just, uh, in the interest of time, oops. I'll just show you what we did on that too. Same plugins. So apparently that 400 Hertz thing was a problem and his kick drum because we cut it pretty drastically here too. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much the same all around. So let's see how it sounds when we add it in. And the thing I like about that for that mic that's further away is, you know, with low frequencies, um, the waveforms just have more time to develop. I mean, you know, physics dictates that those low frequency waveforms are technically longer. And so as you move a mic away from something like a kick drum or a bass amp, you're going to get a rounder sound because you're going to let those waveforms develop for a little longer. So the mic inside or right on the head of the kick drum is great because it gets you that punch and it cuts, it can cut through the mix. 
But if you want the warmth in the body, you really got to back off, I think. Um, and he's not playing it super hard. He plays it harder here at the end. Notice we're not doing anything crazy to try to like cut the snare bleed out of the kick drum or anything like that. I generally for this kind of music, I would never try to like gate or, you know, specifically EQ the kick drum. Um, I would never, you know, penalize the kick drum for all that snare bleed. It's, it's fine in the mix, uh, in my, in my opinion. Uh, let's check out the snare real quick. That's a really nice, bright sound. I think it's a, um, if you care, I think it's this mic. I think it's a Telefunken M80 on the top head of the snare. I don't know what this other mic was. But that's great. That is pointed at the side of the drum, like I said, back a little, because you can hear, you can really hear the body of the snare there. So here's the top mic by itself, and then I'll bring in the, the side mic. Um, so uh, yeah, I love the body of that. I don't particularly, a lot of people mic the bottom of the snare drum. First of all, if you do that, keep in mind that you're almost guaranteed to have those um, mics be out of phase. Anytime you have two mics pointed at each other on opposite sides of an in instrument, they're probably out of phase. So you gotta flip the phase on the bottom mic. I don't particularly like the sound of the of a mic on the bottom of a snare drum. I'm a drummer. I don't know if you can see my drums, but they're right there. Um, and it's just like my thing with the French horns. Nobody listens to the bottom of the snare drum. Um, so, I like this technique that Richie used for catching it from the side because the wood of the snare drum is really what gives it that body. Torin, um, are we creating preset channel strips for the plugins? Not really. Um, I mean, the thing I showed you, you know, the, this collection of, um, this, this set right here is something we keep presets of, um, all the returns. But as far as these chains um, in here, we don't. Now, having said that, we recorded six songs with the same setup. And we did, I think, import all these settings across each of the songs um, just for this, just for this. Um, so I don't know if that's what you were asking, but I, um, yeah. OK, cool. Awesome. Now, um, real quick, I'll just go through. Here's the toms. You can hear what we're doing. Again, not much going on here. See, tiny bit of EQ, but um, this stuff was just recorded well. Um, and uh, my dear, dear friend, Mark Senesak, who works at PlayStation, said to me, said to someone in my presence once, uh, when after I first met him, I started working with Mark over t about 20 years ago. And some guy in the studio one day was like mark tell me tell me how you get your drum sounds what's your technique and mark was like i i, I find a good drummer and a good set of drums and that's pretty much what we had going this day um and mike wise that was either a pair of uh sennheiser 421s or Audix D4s probably D2s D what's the little one hold on I have one right here a D2 and a D4 probably respectively on the rack tom and the floor tom but th these are what Kevin's drums sounded like so there's not much going on um, you can hear the overheads
super compressed. Let's see if we did that recording or here. So we tracked them that way. Um, so that was just a commitment we made in the session. Nice mustache. <laughs> um, so this, uh, notice how much uh, low end we're cutting out of the overheads. It's all of it, right? So watch, I'm going to take this EQ off. And my attitude with that is just in context, you just typically don't need it. So if we listen to all of these um, together, and I'll just bring the overheads in and out. And here how good the imaging on the overheads is too, you're getting all that stereo imaging. Um, the way I like to place overhead mics over a drum kit is not like the traditional XY, like in tight, but I like to actually put them on boom stands as far away from the kit as sort of visually I can tolerate. And then slowly like sit in the control room and have someone slowly move them in um, just until they're really, they like, they sound really good from a phase standpoint. Whoa, that's disturbing. <laughs> that's really disturbing. The fact that not one student has commented on this means that your lecture is so engaging and amazing. I don't know. <laughs> that's a sign of your greatness, John. They might just be scared. Um, so uh, here, let me get <laughs> through the rest of the drums before this really gets out of hand. Uh, so now here's our close room mic. And again, stop me if you have any questions about this stuff. So that again, that's recorded that way. I'm just checking these plugins to see if they're adding any of those crazy effects, but, um, and then this Valhalla room, I'll turn it on and off while we're playing, but this is just one of the Valhalla reverbs. So if you notice, like traditionally, a lot of people feed a reverb off their snare, their close mics on the snare and toms. And Richie and I, this was a very conscious decision where we decided to feed the reverbs off of these weird room mics to just create, it was kind of like that, that Tom Waits comment like thinking in, in those terms. Here's the far room mic added in. So that reverb's nice because it sounds really natural. Um, and then there's this rear mic, which is so that rear mark mic's just super trashy um so that's a drum sound let me show you richie's uh drum squash trick so he's got this um neve compressor across this bus and i'm just gonna pull this in and out while we listen So if you can hear that, it's just adding a ton of body um, to the drums and it it's compressing the whole kit together and you crank that up in the mix and it just adds a lot of presence. And so what we usually do is we get that going 
and then just fiddle with the volume of this in context um, when all the instruments are in there. So um, that is the drum sound. Again, mostly just Kevin and his drums. Um, now, this is just a stem of Peter's. He had a Chinese symbol in his mix. didn't seem like something we needed to recreate. We did record, we did overdub some percussion and this is just me and Kevin with, he had some like weird metal pan and I had a pair of two by fours, I think. Um, and we did this and this, so this is just a pair of mics um, near and far. And if you see, if you look here, they're, they're really heavily processed. We put this Altiverb right on the bus. I mean, right on the, right here is an insert because we wanted it to be part of the sound. Um, the mix is at about, I don't know, 30% here. And uh, we just had like a close pair and a far pair. And I think we just used the far mics and this is just two passes of whatever this is. Check it out. <laughs> And then in the choruses, I think we played. So that's just trashing the whole thing up even more. Those things are pretty heavily compressed too. Check it out. funny thing is that's such a sharp transient if you notice the compressor is not getting any of the attack it's just getting the tail which is kind of funny it was just making it a weird sound uh but it's not keeping it it's not necessarily making it quieter in the mix all right so we get into the bass here so we had the the way we had the room set up for the rhythm section is we had the drummer in the big room um and our, our live room is about 850-ish square feet um, with a pretty high ceiling. The ceiling's about 14 feet. Um, so it's a good size room. And we put the bass player in an ISO room that's about 200 square feet um, just so we could um, not get any drum bleed. And, and we had um, an amp set up in the room with him and it, that does bleed on his acoustic mics. And that was part of um, Richie's design as he just wanted the whole room to be like all bass all the time. So I'll show you the different uh, mics. We had a we had a mic on the bridge, um, kind of between, kind of aimed at the bridge, but kind of uh, even with one of the F holes. And then um, a small diaphragm condenser mic more up around the neck because I wanted to get the you know, I wanted to hear his fingers and, and like anytime he was like popping things and stuff, I wanted to get the clicks and stuff in there, the percussiveness. So I'll start with the bridge mic and then I'll bring in the neck and then the amp. put this um, Waves uh, Overdrive, this uh, GTR pedal thing on the amp, so check it out. Permanently. So then when you're getting your bass sound, I always make sure that it works really well with the drum sound. So I listen, I spend a lot of time listening to them together. And here we've got the same squash trick going on with the bass. I'm going to show you what that sounds like when I take it out. And 
And then check this out real quick. On the base, we've got a little EQ. Um, now, I pushed pretty hard to have this bass sound be um, really, uh, yeah, you guys are commenting on it too, that it's kind of buzzy. And, so, and, and that was by design. You know, We asked him to play that way, and we mixed it and recorded it and EQ'd it that way. Um, not in that order. We recorded it. EQ'd it and mixed it in that way. Uh, I said it backwards. Um, here's the EQ on his final bus. So you can see, um, you know, that EQ is pushing a little bit of the extreme lows and a lot of the highs and just leaving everything in the middle where it is. <clears throat> Now we had um, our keyboard player for the session, uh, Justice Stobern, actually played um, a real Wurlitzer that he brought with him. And um, that's why it's mono. So this is the Wurlitzer down here um, because they didn't have stereo outs. And I'll show you what this sounds like clean. And then here comes his uh, SSL stuff. We a lot of EQ here. And it's funny. So in this case, we're kind of pushing um, the the like sort of bright nasally side of the Wurlitzer forward, um, which I think is really cool. And then there's a slap back. Um, on here and if you look up above that slap where is it oh is it not up here it's down here oh it's right that's right it's right in front of me um we didn't pan it you know i think when i was first messing with this i thought about panning the slap to the other side and trying to make it stereo but then starting to think about a more traditional mix i thought well how about we just have the whirly on one side? And so I panned the slap 40 and the Wurlitzer itself 70, and that's why you get this combo. And then we had a um, guitar player. Let me see. Let me just make sure we're not doing anything else to that Wurlitzer up above. I think it's just, yeah. So we did do something to mess with the stereo image a little. This is the ozone imager. And I'll let you hear this real quick because this is spreading it out. So it's still left heavy. I don't know if you how clearly you can hear that, but it gets a little more narrow. And that's cool because it's um it's frequency specific too. So if you ever get a chance to play with this thing, it's really awesome. A lot of isotope stuff sounds great. I hate the way it looks personally. <laughs> they spent a little more on their gooey um okay the guitars so on this track we had um the session guitarist and then we also had peter's um slide guitar so we had this stem from peter and to sarah's point i think this had some effects baked into it i'm gonna dry it up real quick <laughs> It's just like trashy percussive guitar. And I remember talking to Peter about replacing this, you know, I was like, do you want to overdub acoustic guitar? And he was like, no, it'll sound too good. <laughs> 
So we kept this deliberately. And check out where it sits in the mix. I'm gonna un I'm gonna unsolo it while it's playing because um, it's a really key element. It's one of the percussion percussion instruments. I don't look right. I don't feel right. Ah. With a cheap suitcase and a mile wide grin. I, I think it's a, as big a part of the backbeat as the snare drum. Um, so the uh, Torin boosting um, 3K basically is the main answer to your question. And then this compressor is helping a lot too. So watch when I take the compressor out. I don't look right. I don't feel right. I'm permanently stuck in and it's that trick again where the compressor's boosting the volume um but it's slow if you look at the attack right here it's super slow um and so it's not getting the transient so you're getting the ch of the guitar but then the rest of the body of it just kind of gets sucked out by the compressor um and then uh so there's this guy named uh jackson allen the, who's a local session guitarist and i think is one of the most brilliant session musicians i've ever worked with I, I met him on a session we did right before this peter mcconnell thing and then so this was the second time i'd worked with him um but uh we had him and we just had him playing through um i forget what kind of amp we had but it was in another room and he just kind of went with one sound and he had a lot of pedals and stuff but um this is pretty, I'm gonna take the plugins off and just play you what he sounded like straight out of the amp. And I pan that most of the way to the right just to complement the Wurlitzer so that the two of them together are like this. I'll find a spot where they're playing together. Um, David, I think it was, uh, God, I can't remember. He brought a lot of guitars. He probably had eight or nine guitars with him. So I'm not sure what he was playing on this one. It was some kind of a semi hollow body Gretsch looking thing, but I don't know exactly what it was. Um, I'll, if I remember, I'll try to check with him this week and see if he remembers. The amp may have been like a Fender Champ or something like that. It was a little amp. It was very small. Um, and then we mic'd it with a... Um, a buyer uh 160 which is a ribbon mic um and uh i think that's it um it looks like we probably had two mics on it since it's in stereo um he also played the coolest guitar solo of all time on this song which i think is right here no that's not it hold on here it is Nope. That if you listen to this section in context, the guitar, the guitar solo and the keyboard solo together are some serious comedy. Check it out. That's the extent of the solos on this song. Um, okay, so uh, that's the band. Now let's check out the the brass and woodwinds. Um, 
So we had them set up. There's nine of them, as I mentioned, and we had them set up in a basically in a huge semicircle. And uh, Daria had to stand in the middle and keep them all in line. And it was it was cool because unlike a lot of the um, sort of orchestral, you know, classical stuff that I'm used to doing, like I mean, classical attitude, I guess. Um, most of these guys were like like funk and and jazz players and so it was um you know they weren't as technically i think daria correct me if i'm wrong but i i I think technically they were a little rougher than the kind of section we'd use like for the previous song and in some cases a lot rougher but it added a like sort of the appropriate effect to peter's songs um but i found that um, one of the things Daria did that really impressed me during the session and that totally made the whole thing work was she spent a lot of time in between takes rehearsing them on little sections, which we don't do a whole lot in the more traditional kind of orchestral recordings. Um, and I really, Daria, I don't know if I told you this, but I really appreciated how you kind of pivoted into that mode. And it was more like, it reminded me more of school band where you were like, all right, now we're working this section. Come on, everybody go. And you're like counting them in. And we were just in the control room. Like that's so badass. Uh, they got it, but, um, it really paid off and it was cool. So, um, we had, unlike the last, uh, the last, um, setup, we only have, um, one main pair of room mics and i think they were 150s they were neumann 150s basically the same mics we had on the tree at ocean way and we had them up high back um as far as we could get them from the section and um (laughs) i'm just reading your chat it's awesome um so uh so this is the um the room mics i'm gonna take the plugins off and this is the section just um as they were picked up on that stereo pair And then I'll show you what we did plugin wise. Um, so we've got some altiverb on there. And then it looks like EQ. Here's the EQ, I'll pop it in. It's basically just. Um, rolling off everything below 50 and that's it so this is just here for the filter and then there's a little compression and they're not even really hitting that thing so that's um the idea was that that would be the bulk of the sound but then we've got a spot mic on every player and a lot of these are feeding um reverbs but it's all the same reverb Um, So they're all just going into one reverb and it's all kind of resonating together. So I'll just flip through these real quick um, so you can hear the individual mics. I think for the most part, I don't have a list, but I'm pretty sure we use ribbons on everybody. Um, We, when we built our studio at Facebook, um, we bought a ludicrous amount of ribbon mics uh, last year. So I think I think we have just about all of them. Um, we didn't buy any vintage stuff, and I, I had a whole thing about that. Um, we could do a whole separate class about how we approached building that studio, but I didn't want to buy any vintage gear because I didn't want to have to um, take care of it. And frankly, I think most modern um, recreations of anything, you know, anything you call out to me that you think is like, 
the best vintage, whatever, whether it's a mic or a compressor, somebody makes a cleaner, better modern version of. And I know that's super blasphemous to some people. I feel that way about all the synthesizers in this room too. Um, but we could fight about that on another day. Um, but uh, luckily I was the one making those decisions. So we didn't get any vintage mics. We might someday. Um, but uh, for right now, um, <laughs> I still uh for right now that's what we had but you know we bought um all the aea stuff so we have the you know the 44s and um the 88s and um all that stuff as i mentioned before we have the buyer ribbon mics um we have a lot of royer mics we have cole's ribbons that we used on the trumpet and the saxophones um so that's what you're hearing here i think we used um we also bought the new uh, uh, two two match pairs of the new Neumann um, Tube 67s, which sound absolutely incredible. And I think that's what we used on the clarinets. So this is the I'll start with the clarinet and I'll just work my way down so you can hear all these woodwinds. <laughs> sure i hear the bass clarinet on this one he may have not been playing <laughs> we had some trouble with him he's the star of the story that daria is going to tell you um okay here's the tenor sax The tuba player was a little sloppy and it added like the right amount of drunkenness to the whole thing, which was great. Um, there were a couple things. Peter, Peter writes some pretty challenging tuba parts too. I remember we did a score in Nashville years ago. Um, if you ever get a chance, check it out. It's the, the game was called Sly Cooper for thieves in time. And uh, there's a specific track on there called penguin roundup that everybody should listen to. And it's a, it's basically, it's the scene in the game where you're a giant hippopotamus chasing around all these penguins and like playing whack-a-mole, trying to smash them on the ice. And he used the tuba to be sort of the voice of the hippo Murray. And he used the marimba to be the penguins. And so it's like this weird marimba and tuba duet uh, with the whole band supporting them. And the tuba parts are almost impossible that that, tubist out in nashville pulled it off but it was absurd um this stuff's a lot easier it's just more like a baseline anyway as i went through and soloed those i hope you noticed that they panned all the way around from left to right and that's the order if you look at these mics that the players were seated in so they were just in a big giant semicircle spanning the room um uh from left to right And same with the other track, we had a lot of um, spot mics here, but notice um, these are a lot hotter in the mix. And that's because we want this more in your face kind of rock and roll sound. So if you hear them in, in context, what I'm gonna do, I think I have a group. Do I have a group? I don't, I'm gonna make a group. <laughs> that's all these uh, brass spot mics. And I'm going to pull them in and out while the track plays. And you can hear how, how it changes. Check it out. Is moving in. Mm, it's a full cluster. It's a supernatural. 
natural disaster So hopefully you can hear that. It's like the room mics alone are a really nice blend. And this is another reason why it's really important to work. Um, why it's really important to work uh, in context, because if I were mixing this and I listened to this, this uh, room mic on its own, I think this is a pretty killer sound. <laughs> And it doesn't change that much when it's soloed, bringing the spots in and out. Check it out. But in the mix, it makes a huge difference. Um, so I'll start this playback with the spot mics muted, and then I'll bring them in. So again, the cool thing about this, and I, I always say this, um, whenever conversations pop up on the TAC uh, Facebook group about mixing, I'm usually like the first one to, to point out that mixing is always just about moving faders up and down. And I think hopefully from both the orchestral track and this one, you can see that, you know, nine tenths of what's important about this is where these mics are in relation to each other. And again, back to the theme of this talk, which is talking about large ensembles. Um, yeah, we're doing some EQ and compression and stuff, but most of it overall is pretty subtle. And the point of all this is, is taking all those different mics that you have spread out through your ensemble and getting them balanced in a way, um, that fits the track. So in this case, it's like a lot more present in the case of the other track, it was a much bigger, wider kind of superior thing. Um, and I think that's it. Let's look at Pete's vocals real quick. If everybody's still hanging with me. Um, and I'm going to play you the vocal track we got from Peter. I think. Let's make sure all this stuff is off. We have a lot of stuff on the vocals. It's a lot of stuff. I don't look right. Yeah. Automation. Okay. I don't look right, I don't feel right I'm permanently stuck at a red light With a cheap suitcase and a mile-wide grin And now a man is moving in mm, It's a full-on cluster it's a super net. So I'll just bring in these plugins. The DSer is the first thing to change, just because as you can hear, there's a bunch of crazy sibilance in that track. But again, it's the kind of thing where, um, in my opinion, the performance is so great that I didn't want to ask him to do any of it again. And we built the track around it. Like we recorded with this vocal track, and I felt like if he went home and redid it or something, that it would actually not have as much um sort of immediacy and and energy so i'll bring these in one at a time if you look at this eq you can see um it's boosting a little bit of the mid-range on his vocal right about 900 hertz um cutting a little bit of the low mids out this is like 300 ish um and then cutting some of the extreme highs up here because there's a lot of though however he recorded this there's a lot of um uh, even uh, above the sibilance there's a lot of like splash on it and i know we're, i remember we were trying to get that out and then in this case we put the compressor at the end of the chain to try to take all those eq moves and just kind of um round the whole thing off so i'll bring these in one at a time mm -hmm. 
I don't look right, I don't feel right. And now a man is moving in. Mm, it's a full on cluster. It's a supernatural disaster. And then with Richie, we came up with another squash thing. And so that's right here. And now a man is moving in. And now a man is moving in. Mm, it's a full on cluster. And that thing, uh, to me, that the effect that's having is it's, again, it's kind of reining in some of the transients, and you can even see them in his performance here. Um, and it's uh, warming the whole thing up a bit. So it's having like a really nice effect on the overall thing. And then now check out all the, um, I'll bring the effects in now. Mm -hmm. It's a full on. Mm, it's a full on cluster. So there's this chamber on his vocal, and Richie put this lo fi plug in on it. Uh, this just like avid, crappy lo fi thing, um, which is crazy. Mm, it's a full on cluster. It's pretty subtle, but it's just making his vocal a little crunchier, um, which I appreciated. And then we've got um, this thing that uh, I like to do on vocals, which is just kind of spreading it out and pitch shifting it a little bit. It's really subtle. It's probably about eight or 10 cents on either side, up and down. And you can do that with any pitch shifting plugin, but I like to do that with vocals just to kind of create some space and I'll I'll mute and unmute that while it's playing. Mm, it's a full on cluster. It's a supernatural disaster. All right, Mary Claire says we got to knock off here soon. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um that's it. Uh for this track anyway that's a good that's a good spot um with a cheap suitcase and a mile wide grin this is uh his backup track that he gave me mm, it's a full on cluster so that's peter singing all those harmonies and then we had these additional vocalists and nothing fancy on the vocals, uh, effects wise. Mm, it's a full on cluster. And then there's just a bunch of ad lib stuff here at the end, uh, when they're doing the bibbity bibbity bops and stuff. Cluster. What a supernatural disaster. And as you can tell, there's like a lot more reverb and stuff on the background vocals. So, um, so we're gonna Mary Claire's gonna interrupt me. Hey, everybody watching at home! <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in tonight with Jonathan Mayer. We have to sign off the YouTube channel. We're gonna keep rocking here in our Zoom on our own with our students. I have to say, the nerd force has been very strong in this class. Jonathan is clocking in at a record-breaking three hours. The students are captivated. And we're going to keep rocking here in our own little classroom. But for all of you at home, thank you for joining. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Or sorry, 2 p.m. with Austin Wintry. Uh, so we'll see you then. And uh, have a great night. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye.